All right, so we have 12 noon here. I'm going to start out with some announcements. The Sigma Gamma Epsilon, the Ge Geoscience Honorary, has announced some activities. Hi there. Hello, Heike. There is a planetarium show tomorrow at 6 p.m. Thursday, 11:18. So if you want to go and see the stars, the planetarium on campus is in the Vincent Science Hall. They also have announced a holiday party for our department in the ski lodge on 12-2 uh, at 6 p.m. That's a couple Thursdays from now, a half week after Thanksgiving. And the GGE club is having a club meeting tomorrow during common hour, ATS 311, 1230. And the topic is planning your summer 22. So a lot of um, excellent information about internships and things like that. So those are some activities that we hope people in the department will take advantage of. In the meantime, now I want to introduce Ms. Danny Sesta. Danny is a alum of our department, alumna, and she graduated with a degree in geography and environmental studies. Um, one of the things that I have always enjoyed about teaching here at Slippery Rock is that many of the students come from families who enjoy a camp up in the woods and hunting and fishing. And that provides me with a, a group of students who understand how to keep themselves warm and dry in the woods. So the Monday after Thanksgiving, they're hoping to be sitting out there for hours in the snow. Um, and Danny exemplified that greatly. She's a huge fan of the black bear versus Americanus. And I think that part of the package that she put together to market herself to the park service was the affinity to the black bear and her understanding of its lifestyle dynamics. And in fact, I think it's fair to say she has expertise. So she was hired down at Smoky Mountains, which uh, has kind of a notorious black bear problem because people are sloppy with their food. And then she went on to the uh, Sierra of California. And then I remember when she was up at Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and of course the resurgence of the population of seals and pinnipeds has brought the great white shark into predation closely along the shore where people swim. So I know that she was also out on the Massachusetts coast at a very interesting time when sharks and people were having more and more encounters. Now she's down at Biscayne Bay National Park and amongst the things I hope to hear about today is the Florida manatee. But I can't put her on the spot and, and tell you what she's gonna speak about. She's gonna tell you her experience with the pathways toward a very rewarding career with the Park Service. So with no further ado, thank you, Danny, for coming and joining us. Thank you for the great introduction, Dr. V. Uh, brings so much, so many memories back just to see you and hear your voice. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I um, had a great time the last couple of days pulling together a lot of photos from the last decade or so um, of some really awesome Park Service adventures that I'm uh, thrilled to be able to share with you all. Um, it's been quite a journey. Let me just hit the share button there. All right. Did that turn up okay for all of you that are listening in? Just to make sure before I kick it off. Awesome. That's, Thank you. That's perfect. I'm going to have a seat, but if you, if you need assistance, call me back. I'll be right back. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so as Dr. B said, my name is Danny Cessna. I'm the Chief of Interpretation and Education at Biscayne National Park in South Florida. Um, right now our daytime temperatures are in the 70s and 80s. There's a tiny bit of a chill in the air. Uh, it's really nice. I kind of miss the falls of Pennsylvania, um, but for now this has been a fantastic adventure. So I'm going to take you back to the beginning, tell you how I got here. Um, I first went to Slippery Rock University uh, for English education. I spent maybe one semester in that. I've always loved reading and writing. Uh, I thought I wanted to be an English teacher. 
Um, I was always very much an outdoors person. I grew up hunting and fishing, um, super passionate about conservation and wildlife habitat. Um, wildlife has always been a huge passion of mine. And so I didn't realize there's a lot of careers that actually would allow me to do the things I'm super passionate about for a living. Um, so my first semester as an English ed major, I had a course that many of you may be familiar with. It's called Environmental Geology, taught by Dr. Patrick Burkhart. And I remember the day uh, he took us out to Wolf Creek and he was passionately yelling about never building your house in a floodplain, which I'll remember for my entire life. And just the smell of the snow and it was a little bit of a warm day, so it was melting and it just was one of those perfectly refreshing days um, for a class in the field. And in that moment, I said to myself, I don't care what it is, I gotta find a way to make stuff like this my everyday. So switched my major to um, geography and environmental studies and soon became a passionate member of the GGE department. Um, my time at Slippery Rock is still, I've had so many wonderful things in my life so far, but it's still one of my favorite memories of all time. Um, it very much instilled in me this um, just adamant passion for uh, wild spaces and advocating for those places and ensuring that they're here for future generations. I was a member of a group called the Green Fund um, that was pretty new at that time. I don't know if it's still around, um, but we were always on campus advocating for change. Um, and some of the friendships I made in that group um, will influence me forever. So I applied to an, intern, or an internship with the Student Conservation Association. It was for the summer after my uh, junior year. And at the time, there was lots of different options with the Student Conservation Association. I'm sure there still are. But for me, I was drawn to two particular opportunities. One was Python control in the Everglades, and the other was black bear research in the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, and coming from a long line of hunters in Pennsylvania, there was also a, in, a feral pig control component to the Smokies job. So when they looked at my resume and saw that I was um, proficient at handling firearms and hunting, um, I was a pretty strong candidate for the Smokies job. And they hired me for it. Brand new to the Park Service, no idea what to expect. Um, I rolled into the Smoky Mountains um, and I started working with black bears right away. Um, I would trap and chemically immobilize black bears as part of an elk calf mortality study. Um, so at the time, um, elk had been reintroduced to the Smokies, that was in 2001. And so this was in 2008. Um, they were doing a five-year study on the impact of relocating black bears to the other side of the park to see if that impacted the elk calf mortality rate and allowed them to survive just a little bit longer to get stronger on their feet before the black bears found them. And if that would allow the elk population to get the foothold that it needed to establish in the Smokies. So being an intern, I was very much in the thick of it with the grunt work. I was carrying these huge culvert traps into the woods on the regular. Um, I wanted to show this picture as well because this is how I rolled into the Smokies on my first day. I was wearing my Being Green is Hot shirt. It was very much straight a product of the DGE department, like so excited and so passionate. It went right to park headquarters in the First Amendment expression area and I held out my shirt. And that's a moment that's been captured forever. And I always think back on it because you know, I brought so much energy to that first job thanks to um, so much of what had been instilled in me um, from everyone in GGE. So this is when I found my real passion. Um, I totally fell in love with the Park Service. 
I was still, you know, I was an intern at that point, so I wasn't wearing the green and gray yet, but I knew that was in my future. Um, so if you notice in these series of photos that I show you, down here in the bottom corner where I have my hand on the black bear, that's one of the first times I got to count the respirations of a chemically immobilized black bear. That was part of the data set that we would collect on these bears while we had them in the trap and immobilized. Um, we do things like weigh them and um, we would monitor their respirations and their heart rate the whole time just to make sure they weren't having any effects um, to the drug um, that were unexpected. So the first time I got to count the respirations on a black bear, that grin that you see on my face there, you know, set a lot in motion for me. And so as you watch these pictures over the years, that grin comes around quite a lot in various situations. Um, and one thing that I recommend any of you take away from this today is find what it is that makes you smile like that. And maybe it's not a smile. Maybe you express that kind of love and passion in a different way. But for me, it's always that grin. And if you can find that, whatever you do when you leave Slippery Rock, you need to. Um, spent a lot of time on the Appalachian Trail and this job, got a total love for hiking in wilderness. I'd always been in the woods, always loved hunting and fishing, but this was my first like hit the trail 12 to 17 miles days um, doing bait station surveys where we were checking bear density based on how they um, hit our sardine cans along the trail. Kind of funny, there's some issues with that research that I think um, I, I was picking up on then, like sometimes the same bear would hit our sardine cans all the way up the trail because they're smart like that. So I don't know how much insight those studies actually had into bear density. But I can tell you that the LCAP mortality study was pretty successful. And they found that during that time that we relocated black bears just for the period of time when the LCAPs were being born, mortality went from 80%, 80% of them are dead within weeks to 80% survival of the elk calves and the Smokies. And now they have a really successful, healthy elk population. So very interesting work there. And just in case you're wondering, when you relocate black bears, they almost always come back. So a lot of those bears that we trapped were ones that they trapped in previous years to move just to give time for the elk calves to grow up a little bit. Um, some more insight into that, um, I got to, Re release bears on the regular. I got to pull teeth on black bears. Um, after I did this season in the Smokies, I went home and I started working with the Pennsylvania Game Commission during bear season every year um, because we'd pull a tooth on every bear that would come into the check station during hunting season. Um, at one point, the Pencil Pennsylvania Game Commission said I probably had pulled more teeth on dead black bears than anyone in the state. Um, and the reason we pull that tooth is because you can age a black bear by that premolar right behind the canine, um, almost like you would age uh, the, the growth rings on a tree. So when I concluded my season in the Smokies, I knew I was going to start looking for opportunities in the Park Service again right away. So my next big move was Koya and Kings Canyon National Parks. This was... Um, the summer after my sophomore year, or no, I've, I've got all my years mixed up. Um, I think the, I don't think I graduated yet when I did my season in Sequoia. Um, so I did bear management at Sequoia for another year, which looked very different than bear management in the Smokies. And just to give you a little preview, Sequoia is also where I got my first job actually wearing the uniform, the green and gray. Um, so that season of bear management in Sequoia, I was primarily focused on hazing food conditioned and habituated black bears from developed areas. And so a habituated black bear is a bear that's gotten um, too comfortable being around people. A food conditioned black bear is even worse because they've come to associate people with an easy opportunity for food, like a cooler or a picnic basket, that kind of thing. So um, my responsibility during that season was to drive around in this SUV that you see there. Um, we had lots of equipment on board, like um, paintball gun, which I'll show you here in a minute, uh, firecrackers, 
Um, sometimes I would just be running at black bears, yelling and screaming just to get them out of a developed area. And the whole point of that was we very much wanted um, a black bear to associate people with a negative experience. And so they're very opportunistic. Um, they take easy food sources. Um, so, you know, black bears in most places are very much not like actively hunting and killing like adult deer, for example. Um, they are getting something easy like a mule deer fawn um, or coming into a picnic area. So we would um, try to do these aversive conditioning techniques, which would keep the bears away. We didn't trap a lot until it was the last resort. We didn't relocate in Sequoia ever because the bears would always just come back. So sometimes we would trap and just let them go nearby after we did the chemical mobilization and gather data, um, pulled the tooth and that kind of thing, because that bear would wake up in that trap with all this human scent over him. And a lot of times he would go back to staying away from the developed areas um, because he associated that negative trapping experience with people. Now, the last resort often when we couldn't get a food conditioned bear to um, stay out of developed areas was sometimes euthanasia. So this process was super important to trying to keep bears wild. The first rule of keeping bears wild though is proper food storage. And so a big portion of this job was talking to park visitors and campers walking around the campgrounds um, teaching them how to use their bear boxes so that they would store their food properly. Um, a lot of the interactions that I had with the public as a bear tech in this position, this was also a student conservation association position, um, they were often negative when visitors were out in the resource interacting with the bears in a way they shouldn't be. And so it was during this time that I started, started to get an interest in the interpretation side of park service work which interpretation is connecting visitors to the natural and the cultural resources of the park. There was opportunities in interpretation to get to visitors before they were out doing the bad things with the bears, um, before they were um, you know, making those mistakes that came from a lack of education. And so um, I, I had initially looked at grad school for black bear research. Um, at the time, there was not a lot of opportunities popping up with that. And so by then, I think I had graduated from Slippery Rock. Um, and I went back to Sequoia. Here's a little more bear trapping pictures I had in there. Uh, my paintball gun, my biggest bear ever trapped. I called him the King Bear. I went back to Sequoia as a, my first green and gray job, which was a GS, oh, um, GS 025-5 interpretation ranger. So I included the um, program or the uh, position series number and grade level in here, because if you have an interest in getting into a government job or at a land management agency like the Park Service, um, you'll see this a lot. And so internships, a lot of times are like a, a GS5 equivalent. And so I was able to use my two seasons as an SCA intern um, to compete very well for um, an interpretation position at Sequoia. And so um, this is one of those things you, you, you learn these sort of numbers and stuff um, once you get into it, but it can be kind of daunting when you're starting out. Um, all of the Park Service jobs are posted on uscjobs.gov and include this kind of information. So I'm gonna introduce you all to this kind of stuff as we move through here. Some of you might already know, um, but at the end, too, if I'm always happy to answer follow up questions. So if you are interested in applying to something on USA Jobs in the future, I can definitely help with that. So park ranger interpretation, my day to day, I was going around the different areas of the park and I was giving ranger led walks and talks. Um, this picture here is up on Morrill Rock in Sequoia National Park. Um, got a lot of attention recently because they had such a horrible fire season out there. And there's this really iconic photo of everything around Morro Rock burning. It's, it's kind of tough to see. Um, but I spent a lot of days um, staffing the visitor center at the Giant Forest Museum. Um, after that season, they kept me on intermittently throughout the winter. I got to lead snowshoe walks. 
Um, I got to staff the Lodgepole Visitor Center. Sequoia was magical in the winter. It was the time of year where you could have the park all to yourself, uh, which is great. Not that I didn't love the visitors. I, I'm still always here for the visitors, but something that you get as a park service employee is you get those quiet moments. I think a lot more than other folks get just visiting national parks. Um, and there's nothing that beats seeing the sequoia in the snow. And my adventures at Sequoia continued. I was there for six years. Um, I was a seasonal for the first couple. Uh, got a couple examples here of just what a different world it is in the high elevations of Sequoia. When a tree falls in Sequoia, they have an entire crew that has to go and address it. And this picture here is not even a Sequoia tree, it's a sugar pine. They're still huge. It's, it's just a whole other world. Pictures don't do it justice, but I wanted to give you a little taste of what life was like for me during that time. I got my first permanent job with the Park Service. Um, at the time, I was able to, there was a hiring authority with the Park Service that um, gave permanent job opportunities to students. And at that time, I had started a um, Parks and Resource Management Master's with Slippery Rock. And that actually helped me um, compete for a permanent job in the foothills of Sequoia National Park. So I moved from the big trees in the snow down to Ash Mountain, um, where it was blue oak woodlands and lots of black bears still. Um, that was one of the things about having all the black bear experience that, that, that I had. Um, the bear management folks, even though I had moved over to interpretation, they would still call on me to help out a lot when they had a bear in a trap which was awesome. One of the most rewarding things about my time as a permanent park guide, I was what's considered career seasonal. So I would usually have about a month of furlough. Um, every year it would be time that I was in non-pay non status, but I worked the rest of the year. And so I was in charge of the phenology program for uh, the Foothills area. And this is when I really became passionate about climate change communication because we were monitoring blue oaks and buckeyes um, for their phenophases every year. Um, I had a team of community scientists who would gather that data and had been collecting it for a number of years. And we could start to see changes in the phenophases of the blue oaks and buckeyes in the foothills due to impacts from climate change. And so we, a lot of times, use this phenophase data to develop educational programming around climate change. And it was very much a different story when you had folks from the local community who are actually collecting the data on the trees and were able to see the trends over the years. It made climate change much more of a tangible thing for a lot of people and uh, helped a lot in our efforts of raising awareness, especially in the local community. I also was a part of an education program in the foothills where we would take middle schoolers from the Central Valley of California. Um, a lot of them came from families that were fruit packers or worked in the agricultural industry in some way um, and relied a lot on the water, um, the snowpack that would come down from the high Sierra to be used as irrigation in the Central Valley of California. And for a lot of these kids, they only had a concept of the watershed as you know, when they turn on their tap or when they have their irrigation system running in the orchards. Um, so the efforts of that education program was called Sequoia for Youth, um, were us completing this picture for these kids. So we'd start at the bottom of the watershed. We'd take them all the way up to the snow by the end. Um, and a big piece of that was um, looking at water quality. And so this is one of my favorite pictures from that time. We take the kids into the stream and waders. We collect all the macrovertebrate, uh, macro invertebrates, um, and we would have the kids identify them to help determine the health of the stream. That was a really rewarding and fulfilling program and uh, made me realize how important it is to get kids into the parks who wouldn't have otherwise had the opportunity. Woodhills wildlife was totally different from the, what I was used to in the high elevations. In the fall, especially, you always see a lot of tarantulas. 
and tarantula hawks. That wasp that you see on the left there, that is a tarantula hawk. And they have the most crazy life story. Um, the tarantula hawk will actually lay, they'll sting a tarantula. So it's totally immobilized. And then they lay its eggs on the tarantula and the tarantula um, is just paralyzed for this whole time, but totally alive. Hi, Danny, if you can hear the me. The eggs hatch well. and then they eat the den. What's that, Dr. B? Um, your audio feed froze for a minute. So if you would retell the story of the eggs on the tarantula, that would be great. No problem. Um, so the tarantula hawk actually stings the tarantula and paralyzes it, drags it to a dark place, like a safe little nook somewhere, lays its eggs on the tarantula, and then the eggs hatched and eat the tarantula alive while it's totally paralyzed. So I was working with visitors at a road construction block in the park one day, and I saw this tarantula hawk actually grab this tarantula, sting it, and try to drag it into the wheel well of a vehicle that was parked on the road. So clearly it wasn't going to work out for the tarantula hawk because he wasn't even trying to take the tarantula to the right place. So um, I got the tarantula for educational purposes because I wanted to see what happens if the eggs don't get laid and the tarantula is just paralyzed going forward. So um, to my boss's horror at the time, I had this tarantula for months in the visitor center and I would flip it over every couple of days and drip water onto its little chalicera. And slowly but surely that tarantula started to recover and it became our little visitor center mascot at that time. So <laughs> I think um, that was many years ago, but I think they still talk about me rehabilitating a tarantula at the Foothills Visitor Center in Sequoia. So I did that, that permanent park guide job in the foothills for three years. And then I got picked up into what's called a detail in the park service where they had a vacancy um, in the giant forest for a sub-district interpreter position. Um, and I went and I filled in on that position for the summer. Um, that went really well. It was my first experience as a supervisor where I supervised the team of seasonals that worked the visitor center at Giant Forest and Lodgepole that summer. And then I had to go back to my permanent job in the foothills. But I was working on gaining that experience because I had an inkling at that point I wanted to be a supervisor. So I, the next summer, I took another similar detail in Kings Canyon on the Grant Grove side and supervised their seasonal staff there for the summer. And then not long after that, I actually got the sub-district interpreter job permanently. Um, it was a GS7 position, um, and it was one of those what we call in the park service a ladder position. So I was eligible if everything went well and I got my time and grade, which is getting a year's time in as a GS7. I was eligible to be promoted to a GS9. Um, but in the meantime, I had started to get the itch for something new. I absolutely adored Sequoia, but I'd been there for six years at that point. Um, I knew that it was getting close to time to find a new opportunity. So I started looking on uthejobs.gov again, where all the Park Service jobs are posted, um, and something completely different came my way. And I skipped ahead in my whole narrative a little bit. I did want to give you some of my lessons learned in Sequoia before I get to the next adventure. Um, so lessons learned in Sequoia, education versus enforcement. Education is always better. I felt like I made a lot greater impact, positive impact on park visitors when I was in interpretation and I was educating them about why they shouldn't allow bears to get their food versus when I was a bear tech and I was out running around and yelling pe at people for their poor food storage and trying to get them back from the bears and sometimes issuing citations if they didn't have proper food storage. So that was a big lesson for me. I learned 
that it's a lot more effective to get to them in a positive way um, before it gets to the enforcement point. Climate change communication is key. Sequoia set the stage for me to be very vocal about climate change in my career going forward. Fire is essential. The wildfires in Sequoia are absolutely essential to propagate um, new sequoias. You get thousands and thousands of seeds that would be dispersed um, after the cones opened after a wildfire. That being said, you can also have fires that are too hot and prevent the proper conditions for sequoias growing. This last summer, the Park Service had one of its biggest fires ever at Sequoia. And uh, we had to send resources from all over the Park Service to try to help with that. It was a really scary situation. So fire severity is getting worse. It's an important part of the ecosystem, but it doesn't work the way it should when climate change is a driving factor in the severity of those fires. Wilderness is wonderful. I came to love the High Sierra so much. The granite, ah, the serenity. If you ever need some just quiet time in a wild place, Sequoia is the perfect, perfect place for it. Community science rocks. I worked with so many great community scientists, volunteers from the local community that were so eager to be a part of the park and the mission and really develop their sense of place around their science contributions for the park. National Park volunteers are amazing. I worked with so many of them in the visitor centers over the years. Um, I still, from my time in Sequoia, I have a 90 year old volunteer who writes me letters every week. And it's one thing when you're getting paid to work in the parks, because that pay factors in. But when you're just giving your time after you've retired or, you know, or you're a student and you're giving your time, it's really meaningful. And the people that are willing to do that are really special people. And as I mentioned, this whole six years of my life is when I realized that leadership and management might be for me. I was still figuring it out, but we'll see how that progresses. And I just wanted to share with you a couple of my wilderness shots from my favorite places in Sequoia. This is on the lakes trail out of Pear Lake. If you ever get to do it, it's amazing. Um, this is the Mineral King area of Sequoia, another absolutely stunning place. And as I mentioned, wildlife's always been my passion. So if I didn't collect a ton of wildlife photos during my time there, it's, I had to show them to you. So quick little side story here, that little Western screech owl that you see there in the bottom left. I was driving home from the Foothills Visitor Center and that owl hit my car and I thought it was dead. I stopped and I pulled off on the side of the road as I do when there's interesting dead wildlife. And I looked at that owl and I said, I bet you the park biologist would really like to take a look at this. So I put this little owl carcass on the front seat of my car and I continued to drive up the mountain. There was bad road construction in the park at that time. There was a one-way section of road where you had to hurry up and pass through on a green light or else you were gonna hit coming down. And if any of you have driven through Sequoia, that's a lot of switchbacks and you don't want to hit traffic on a one lane road. While I was traversing that three mile section of one lane, the owl woke up. And so I had to drive the whole way home with an owl flying around my car because by then I was so high in elevation, I was afraid to let the owl out because I was afraid I wasn't even in his habitat anymore. So in the name of making sure the owl got back to the right habitat, I drove home with an owl like in my hair as I'm trying to navigate the switchbacks of Sequoia National Park. And so he spent the night on perched on a little antler in my spare bedroom in my park housing. And then I drove him all the way back down the hill the next day and released him where he had hit my car in the first place. So learning moment there, if an owl hits your car, it's probably not dead because I later found out they have very thick skulls. So back to that next adventure that was kind of unexpected in a whole different way. So Cape Cod National Seashore offered me a district interpreter position, which was a GS 911. So it was a good promotion from the seven that I was in Sequoia. And I was ready to switch it up um, to the ocean life. I always thought I would be a mountain girl. Um, you know, black bears are still my 
my passion. I literally have a black bear paw print tattoo. <laughs> so I wasn't ever going to leave that behind completely, but I was open to some other interesting critters. And this, I can safely say, was the first step in my career where um, the work I was doing became more about my team over what I was doing as an individual. And this is when I found my next greatest passion in the park service. And that was cultivating an amazing team of rangers, supporting them through everything to get their work done and also to build their futures in the park service. Um, I supervised everyone from interns that were just like me when I was at Slippery Rock all the way up to an 86 year old who had been an old time Cape Cotter for years. Um, that's him here on the left. He had since passed away, but he was a legend. He used to draw crowds from miles away. He had this crazy story about shoving Rachel Carson into a lighthouse through the window when she was on the Cape one year. And so things like that made him a real gem. I was also at this time getting into coaching interpretive programs where I would help um, my staff make their connections with visitors the best they can be. And then at the same time, as Dr. B mentioned, I was a part of the Cape Cod White Shark Working Group. And so it was myself and the Chief of Visitor and Resource Protection. We were the two representatives from Cape Cod National Seashore that worked with the local community to grapple with the reality of the sharks and seals on the Cape. Um, after the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which was right about 1971 or 72, uh, the gray seal population greatly rebounded on the Cape. And so you had all these folks, whether they were local or they were people who had vacationed on the Cape for years, um, the seashore would get about 4 million visitors a year. And that was folks solely driving onto the Cape from like New York, Boston area um, because their families had been doing it forever. There was a lot of summer homes on the Cape and those people had been swimming in Cape Cod waters for their entire lives never had to think twice about a white shark. And now everybody had to accept that as a reality. And that's because the ecosystem had returned to its natural state. And this predator prey interaction between the sharks and seals was happening right off of the swimming beaches where um, everybody liked to recreate. So this was a huge learning experience for me. Um, I had dealt with human wildlife contact or uh, conflict at Sequoia. Um, but this was a whole other level because it was very interwoven with the local community. And it wasn't just their national park. For them, it was very much their backyard this was happening in. And so um, a big part of my role was making sure the messaging and the communication was very clear on why the ecosystem needs both sharks and seals. Um, why it's a really amazing opportunity to see these apex predators and why they can still enjoy the seashore, they just have to be aware of the risk. And I often compared it to places like Yellowstone where people recreate in Yellowstone all the time, but they take precautions to make sure they don't run into a grizzly bear in the wrong way. So I made a lot of comparisons like that. I We'd emphasize things like making sure you don't swim alone, um, making sure that you don't go into too deep, um, things like that helped, but it, it was tricky. And uh, while I was on the Cape, um, we actually did have our only fatality from a white shark um, biting a boogie boarder. And I'll remember that for my whole life because I was actually swimming um, a few miles to the south when it happened. Uh, it, was, it was tough. It changed the whole dialogue for everybody. And you know, I'll never forget grappling with that, the way that changed the visitor mentality. And it's still one of those things where visitors were a thousand times more likely to have an accident on the highway on the way onto the Cape than they were to ever be bitten by a white shark. But it was such a, it just mentally weighed on people a lot, um, just because people tend to normalize car accidents, but shark bite is a whole different thing. And Jaws did no favors for the white sharks off Cape Cod. As much as I love the movie Jaws, not a great thing for white sharks. So 
Um, that's still an ongoing conversation on the Cape. And I was there for four years and I felt like I helped a lot with it. Um, but there's still progress to be made. Other aspects of the job. Of course, I always have to get a critter in there with my salamander. I also got to be um, trained in the National Park Service Historic Weapons Program because Cape Cod had a Lyle gun, which was a remnant from the U.S. Life Saving Station, where they actually used to launch a projectile out of a tiny cannon that was attached to a rope, and they could actually basically zip line people off of shipwrecks off of shore. Off of shore. So um, Cape Cod had one of the only historic weapons programs where we actually still got to fire the projectile. And um, up in the North District, we would demonstrate um, with the full life-saving station white uniform. This is before the Coast Guard. Um, and actually, we would get to fire the projectile. So that was really cool. Um, and then I included this picture of me answering a visitor question at the visitor center. Um, because part of my job was I always got the tough questions. And so this particular day, there was a visitor who was um, recreating the bird calls that he'd heard over the phone. And I was identifying them as he hooted them out to me on the phone. And I had had one volunteer who's like, he took the call originally. And he's like, you know, this one's beyond me. <laughs> I can get somebody to help. And of course, as the supervisor at the visitor center, I stepped in. And I felt like I'd reached the pinnacle of visitor services when I was able to start IDing bird calls that were sung to me over the phone. Um, Cape Cod was one of those places where I had left the big, big, majestic beauty of the West. And that'll always have a special place in my heart. Cape Cod, it was a beauty that snuck up on me. Um, it was a place that really sunk into my soul in a way that I almost didn't expect um, because it isn't those vast expanses of the West. It's a very small spit of sand on the Atlantic. And you saw in that staff picture, all our arms up. That's the little arm of the Cape that you always use to point to where you live on Cape Cod on your arm. So very small place, but it, it was a, the, the weather was always so moody and um, it, it was very inspirational the way uh, art went so well with the Cape. And I think this is where I learned this a lot was at this location that art and science very much go hand in hand. Um, I worked with a lot of artists on the Cape that, that use what was going on in the seashore for inspiration. And I found that to be really moving. I was mentioned I was an English ed major first. And this is when I first started to reintegrate that love of English and writing into my Park Service career. I used to host the nature journaling um, program there every week. And it was really interesting to see how the things I love that the Park Service could very easily mesh with that creative artistic side of me. Exciting challenges from Cape Cod. I was there for the National Park Centennial in 2016. Um, we teamed up with the Cape Cod Symphony Orchestra. I got to work with a composer who wrote a piece of music specifically for the centennial at Cape Cod. We had 3,000 people show up, and I was in charge of narrating, memorizing from start to finish, a piece of writing that went with the music that the composer developed. And... Uh, it's probably always going to be one of the highlights of my career. It was as close to a, a major performance as I think any park ranger ever gets. Um, and it was, it was really moving and very special. And, and I'll remember that centennial year forever. Um, the ranger who actually wrote the piece um, is there in the middle right next to me. Um, I supervised her for four years and she was uh, really brilliant at that. Um, interweaving of art and science in the national seashore. Other things, the eclipse in 2017, we'd advertised a small porch talk um, to address the eclipse on the Cape because it was only supposed to be like 50 or 60 percent. We didn't expect a lot of interest. We ended up getting 2,000 people that day. We shut down traffic on Route 6 inadvertently. I looked out on the front yard of the visitor center and it looked like the apocalypse. I was terrified that somebody was going to have a heart attack and I wouldn't be able to get help there. 
but my team buckled down. We managed to stream the eclipse in the auditorium. We, we just uh, pulled out all the stops. And it was one of those moments that I was really proud of as a supervisor. I was expecting angry calls to the superintendent's office after the fact. I had a neighbor down the road come and say he had seven people parked on his lawn, but he was fine with it. He's like, this is a cool event. He's like, I, I'm glad I walked up here. It ended really well. And it was just one of those moments that I've learned throughout my Park Service career where adaptability and flexibility is key. Um, I also was very much a change maker in this operation on the National Seashore. A lot of employees there had been there for a long time and they weren't always used to outside the box ideas or, or innovation. And for that, I brought a lot of new stuff to the table and you know, there were some growing pains with that. And so me as a leader and a manager, I learned to usher them through that change and um, make sure they felt heard. And I think that was a, a big learning moment for me. Uh, and then the super invested community. I touched on that a little bit with um, the white sharks, but the community, because the national seashore boundary, it's not a firm boundary. There's private inholdings all throughout the six towns that encompass the national seashore. So working with community and partnerships, it was a whole other level for me with this and uh, really rewarding work. Other lessons learned that are worth sharing. Um, I am somebody who's a really empathetic person. Um, many years ago, I would have described myself as sensitive, um, you know, quick to tear up in moving moments. Um, and I very much at Cape Cod learned that that's a strength and not a weakness um, because it does make me someone super invested in my team and my rangers and making sure they're happy, healthy. Um, and happy, healthy rangers are really good at their jobs. Climate change communication is key. Again, it was a big topic for me on the Cape. Um, here it was different because the effects of climate change were more obvious. Uh, the salt marsh that you see in the background of this picture, um, salt marsh grasses were being um, inundated with high tide a lot longer than they used to be. And that's gonna have long-term impacts on your salt marshes. Salt marshes are very much a buffer for storms, nor'easters, hurricanes on the Cape. Um, and so it's a really important thing to have there. And, and I communicated that a lot to the local community. And in some ways it was easier in, than it was in Sequoia because it was more obvious, but still equally important. Um, Addressing that human wildlife contact, uh, conflict is challenging, but worthwhile. Um, and I also learned on the Cape that the Park Service very much has a diversity problem. We need a variety of backgrounds. We need um, people of color. We need different ages, everything. Um, and that's something that if I can make a difference on in my lifetime in the Park Service, I it's a big goal of mine. Um, Cape Cod was a community that wasn't very diverse. And that's part of what drew me to my next step at Biscayne. So I'll get to that. A couple of my favorite shots from Cape, the Cape. If you ever have an opportunity to have a Cape Cod beach fire, please do. It's a magical experience and I'll remember that no matter where I go in the world. Little hint into my free time on the Cape. We caught blue crabs every summer, we cooked them up, we harvested wild cranberries, caught stripers, bluefish, and then I volunteered with the Audubon to pick up cold stunned sea turtles off of the beach in the winter and get them shipped south so that they could survive. So for somebody who is so into wildlife and, um, you know, it's not like seeing black bears everywhere like I did in other places, but I found wildlife in really special ways in the Cape. A couple other moody Cape Cod photos. So in spring of 2019, I saw a position open up at Biscayne National Park in South Florida. I uh, saw it was a chief of interpretation position, which was a big step. I had never been a chief up to that point. It's a GS-12. Um, and it's managing all aspects of visitor services for the entire park and sitting on the park management team. So I applied. I'm not necessarily expecting a lot. I had a lot of good experience under my belt, but, 
you know, there's always that little voice in your head that's like, am I ready? Am I capable? One thing I learned throughout this ex park service experience, um, ap applying for different jobs over the years is never self reject. You see a job that interests you, you put in for it and you, you let HR or the hiring official tell you that you're not ready for that job. You never tell yourself that because every one of these positions I ever applied for and got took some going out of my comfort zone. So I first took this job as a detail, but it was a really good fit. And I ended up getting hired into the position permanently. And that's where I am now. You can see in my background here, this is the Boca Chita Lighthouse. Um, I have a fantastic education program here. Um, we had to pivot to distance learning for COVID and that's going really well. We're able to get kids out into the park and into the resource. This is a whole other level of mosquitoes down here. You all please know this. Um, it's doable. I can survive it, but summers in Biscayne National Park out on our islands, you have to wear earmuffs because otherwise your sanity is at jeopardy because there's so many mosquitoes buzzing around your mosquito suit. So keep that in mind. I adore it here. It, it's amazing but that is a huge factor in the summer. So by this time of year in Florida, you'll find me on these islands all the time. But when I have to put on that bug suit in the summer, it, it's not the most fun I've had. But remember way back when I said one of the SCA positions that I was interested in was Python control? Here I am 12, 13 years later, and now I'm officially trained in Python control. So believe it or not, we find pythons one or two miles out in the bay in the park sometimes that we have to catch and kill. Um, it's a terrible invasive species problem down here in South Florida. The Everglades has it way worse than Biscayne, but they're right next door. Um, so we often deal with pythons here in the park. The nice thing about being a chief of interp is that I have my hands in a lot of different projects that go on in the park. Um, this is an example of a no motor zone project that we wanted to put in around this lighthouse here because we typically get a lot of people who would um, anchor their boats or tie off their boats right under the lighthouse, which was impacting the visitor experience there. So um, because I work a lot with philanthropic partners now in the park service, I often have to message the park's needs to these philanthropic partners. So I get to say to our wonderful um, Park Service volunteer here named Terry, who is a diver extraordinaire, I get to say to him, Terry, I want to go out with you to install the buoys because I need to know how to message buoy maintenance to our partners. And so I'll spend the day with Terry free diving to install the hardware on the um, floor of the bay to install buoys. So um, that's one thing I never expected I'd be doing. I never thought I'd be a free diver, but that's what's come from me broadening my horizons and leaving the mountains a bit. Um, exciting challenges here at Biscayne. Um, right now we are still navigating through COVID. So we um, typically have these great, big, beautiful um, citizenship ceremonies here at the park where people actually get their citizenship um, right here on the shore of Biscayne Bay. It's one of the most rewarding programs I've been a part of. Cannot wait to get back to that when we're able to have larger groups. Um, because this is my first chief position, I've had a lot to learn, and there's definitely challenges that come with that, uh, but it's been very, very rewarding. Um, the park was very much in transition when I first got here. We have a brand new superintendent, so working with her um, to set this park on the right track has been really interesting. And this is also a park that has a bit of an identity crisis. Um, we are right in Miami's backyard. I can look across the bay and see the Miami skyline. You can be out in the mangroves in the middle of the bay, paddle boarding to your heart's content, never even know that you're so close to a major urban area, but we are. And a lot of those folks that recreate in the park don't realize we're a national park. So we're working on that. And that kind of ties into this last point of the urban interface. It's very much a big opportunity and also at times a challenge. The opportunity lies though, where I can get kiddos into this park to experience nature many times for the first time and it's right here in their backyard. 
And so we take kids out on the island for camping. Um, we have them cook their own meals. We have them put up their own tents. Uh, and by the end of that three day weekend, uh, it's pretty transformational. They're, they're whole new kids by then. So it's a great opportunity. Lessons I've learned so far, climate change communication is key, is key. I will drive that home forever. That's like my equivalent of Dr. B's don't build in a flood zone. Um, that we're seeing here, the increase in king tide levels, um, all our park infrastructure um, we've had to replace due to hurricanes. We're under some huge Hurricane Irma repair projects at the park right now. And we're very much planning those, pros those projects um, in line with um, resilience and not building things back the way they were, but building them for a future in light of increased storm severity. Other things I've learned, shipwrecks are awesome. Very much got into the park service because I'm a natural resources geek. I love wildlife. There's some really cool cultural history in these parks. Here you can snorkel a gorgeous shipwreck in 10 feet of water. I also learned how to be assertive because now I'm representing the needs of an entire division of the park. And so all aspects of visitor services and the needs of my team, I have to advocate for, and I have to communicate well, both up and down between myself and the superintendent and myself and my team. So lots to learn there. Our employees are our greatest resource. I've really become wellness focused, work-life balance focused. So we're very passionate about our jobs in the park service. And sometimes it's easy to overdo it. You need to spend that time outside of work enjoying the resource too. So that's become a big point for me. Finding your network is so important. Um, as I navigate these different career steps, I have developed a really fantastic group of park service friends who are at either equal level as me or a step above or a step below. And for the ones that are steps behind me, I do everything I can to bring them up with me in however many stages I go through in this career. Um, if there's opportunities, I love getting interns into seasonal jobs or seasonals into permanent jobs. Um, and I love having peers or folks above me who I can seek guidance for for my own next career steps. And so if you're someone who thrives on an amazing network, the park service is a great place for it. Um, and also I am a federal employee. So there's a lot of guidelines, there's a lot of policies, there's a lot of ethics and that can be a lot to keep track of. Um, but I've learned to navigate that over time and speak the language. And while there's definitely frustrations on someone who's been in an, you know, in an environmentally, you know, an advocate minded person, sometimes in the changes in different administrations in the federal government, it can, there can be challenges that come with that. Um, so you gotta know how to work within the rules, but push the envelope sometimes too. And then my last point here is sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. So it goes back to that point, never self reject yourself from an opportunity. Um, there's definitely been moments in my first days as a chief and still now I've been at it three years where you have those days where you're like, man, am I cut out for this? Do I, do I know how to tackle this challenge? And sometimes you just have to tell yourself, yeah, I do. You might not believe it in that moment, but you'll come around to it. The best thing I love about South Florida is that Everglades and Big Cypress are right in our backyards. So I have an awesome network of coworkers that I get to work with at the other South Florida parks as well. Um, I've been tramping around in the swamp in Big Cypress a lot looking for orchids. This little green one on the bottom left is the infamous, infamous ghost orchid. Have not yet found one blooming, but I'm working on it. I love going over to Everglades for the alligators. This is one of the only places, this is the only place in the world where alligators and the American crocodile often coexist together. And I've become even more of a bird nerd in my times tromping around the Everglades. And I even get to work with the folks out at Dry Tortugas a lot too. Um, I just went out there in July and it's absolutely an adventure. And then my free time in South Florida is absolutely spectacular. This is that work-life balance I talked about. Um, so we're always in the water and under the water. Um, Oh, my screen sharing has stopped, but my last little bit I wanted to say is that 
this whole park service adventure was very much because of the seeds that were planted in me um, at Slippery Rock University so many years ago. And, you know, it's been a winding journey, but I'm thankful all the time for the foundation that was set um, way back then. So I'm going to put my information in the chat. If any of you ever want information on National Park Service careers, um, I can, you know, go deeper on any of this that I brought up today, answer any questions. Um, please feel free to reach out to me, email me anytime. I am happy to help should you want to pursue a path like this. And it, it looks different for everybody, but I'm really good at helping pave the way. Yahoo, Danny, way to be. Um, I'm so proud of you, and I'm very, very thankful. I'm in the November spirit of giving thanks and gratitude, and I'm really appreciative. You did a fine job establishing that, uh, constructing that PowerPoint, and it looks like now you have a beautiful portfolio that you can carry forward from this to any other time you need to introduce yourself. I'd give you a job in a second. Oh, uh, thank you. I thank you, and uh, I appreciate your time with us. Um, the crowd dwindled down, but I guarantee you that everybody who was here enjoyed every minute of it. And uh, we'll get you the YouTube link so you can share this lecture uh, with anyone you like to. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the chance to talk to you. Yeah, I appreciate it, too. You have a happy Thanksgiving. All right, my friend? Yep, you too. Take care. Bye now. Bye.